This is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri. We are with Fahima Ife and her stunning new collection, Septet for the Luminous Ones. Luminous Fahima, read us a bit of this book, please. Okay. I'm going to start with the poem called Autosomal Music. Autosomal music. That first day soul brought our independent soma into cohesion. I savored it as if within and without a moment's notice. You asked that question that was not really a question as much as an entry point, a seam to break the silence. All that sentience, you offloading the sonic truck, me holding the house wide at its hinge of open angels. I felt you then, sensing me all the way to the hollow bone. And no one ever senses me that close since I like to burrow inside the metallic folds of all this armor. Being nobility again, I want to reach across the abstract minefield and stop the hunt before it opens. Stopping pressure as if out the superficial feel of uncertainty, I reach across the glowing quiet, listen as if vines creeping, trilling soft. Then you say that thing that makes it think you mean to stay forever. No one ever really wants to stay or that's the residual trace of abandonment. The worst part about all this labor is we never really get to touch the ones we love when we need to love or feel something other than utility or worth. When I look back on it, I understand you were speaking to me without speaking as if every line I struggled to bend for the purposes of something whose purpose is never really clear until it hits. Like that day when it hit us in November, you say, ocean is strong today. You say, vasana. And I smile as if we had always been smelling it. I feel a feeling I often feel, often in distance, the sensuality of scent before sent. Fahima, she is a devotional poet and lyrical essayist, the author of this book, the chapbook Abalone, and an another collection, Maroon Choreography. She has performed many places, and we'll talk about that later. Fahima, can I just say that I have been reading and writing poetry for more than 80 years, and I said to a friend yesterday, it, I long for poetry that will thrill me and surprise me. Congratulations. Thank you. I mean it. it. I am delighted. I am delighted with this book. Tell us what this book is about. So this book, it continues the work I started in Maroon Choreography, which is about myth making and trying to locate new myths among um, African and indigenous peoples in the so-called new world. So here in like the Caribbean and the mainland of the United States. And so where maroon choreography was concerned with midnight, you know, and um, stealing away or the people who practiced the type of fugitivity that took them to the forest, you know, like and was really preoccupied with midnight and what happened in the dark. Septet for the Luminous Ones is really concerned with day and brightness. And so there's a lot of ceremonial work that I did in the creation of the book that took me into like the noon, you know, around noontime, you know, public space of being with people at the beach and meeting all of these humans while simultaneously trying to create a new myth of what might have happened when the first, you know, like African of Yoruba descent met like a Taino person here and they made love and they created, you know, like a sort of new lineage, which I'm ancestrally, it's like I'm part of that lineage. And so I'm always so obsessed with trying to go back to the beginning. Oh, Bahama, <laughs> yes, you did all that. Now I have to talk about the juxtaposition of words because you do create different combinations. And I do believe that this does two things. One, it shows enormous trust in the reader. And two, it asks a great deal of the reader. Mm -hmm. You are aware of both of those things, right? Right. And you're not afraid of both of those things. I'm not. <laughs> what I'm gave not. you the ability to really think that I would get it? I mean, I think just the the lineages and the traditions that I write in, you know, so it's like the the poets who 
you know, are associated with like the Black arts movement and the language poets, I'm always kind of like, you know, writing within, I think, the realms of all of that. And I feel like if there was a sort of permission, then it came through the dexterity of that work, you know, where it's like reading that work, I felt like I had to do a lot of work, you know, like I had to, I had to surrender, you know, to what was happening within the line breaks and in the, in the Cicera, you know, like in the, in the gaps and in the secret. And I think I always, I don't know, like there's a part of me, like, I feel like I'm definitely a poet's poet, you know, on one hand. Oh, yes. But right? don't we want you? Don't right. we long for you? Right. But then, you know, in addition to that, I also want the work to to extend beyond, you know, like our our poetry scenes. And so I think I'm always just imagining an audience that that does want to do that sort of work and 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 also is OK with being in the unknown, you know, that if something lands and it's like, I have no idea what that means, you know, that they would still be willing to to listen. But when we finish the book, we feel things. And it's like, do you want to apologize for jazz? Right. You know, so you're off note. Um, I want to tell everyone that you have performed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of the African Diaspora, the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, and you have been published and celebrated widely for a person so young. <laughs> so give us some more of your luminous book. Okay. And another one. This one is Alchemical Sirens. Alchemical sirens, who look at us at dawn when the sun goes down, when moon admits the end of world a turn, what transmutation is this? Having crossed prehistoric minuet of Southwest 66, of monsoon alien mind field after the mind fuck of climate collision, a silver hydroplane grips us until yin. And who is our witness, our last having fled or left behind or at a change of frequency? It felt it kept coming out with a quiet sense of happiness called into the poem, a criado on repeat. It felt it kept coming out as love. As air speaks through we, a filling of home, sylph becomes womb. And what we want to do is do it again. Nasturtium, the song we sing in anticipation of love to mescent musk of love and lust in equal measure. It flickers in balsamic appeal, moist in the palms of our hands, a psalm, a lamp, a sap in our laps, an asp. Plausible love song after love poems were last put on hold, as in black art. The new black art is this find the lost soul and love it. We want poems that love and vines of dancing fuchsia, of absence, of presence calling, of glowing portals, ecological sacrament of seams. At the root of it, lithium pulses perineum until quiet comes, red tide of nomenclature of semi-automatic life in a box is pretty. And as the throat birds, as the fever clutches, a pause, alone, something in ether. Fahima, she is the Associate Professor of Global African Aesthetics, Poetics. Is it called Aesthetics and Poetics? Yes. And Director of the Black Studies Minor in the Department of Critical Race and Ethnic S Studies at the University of California, Santa, Santa Cruz. There, I got that out. Um, tell me about the diaspora. When I read your book, which take us up, takes us up a notch, um, I believe that it means more than Yoruba. It mo means more than the Caribbean. It means more than a geographic diaspora. What is your spiritual mission here? It's a new paradigm. Right. Oh, I love that you phrase it as spiritual mission. I mean, I think my spiritual mission is to it's it's all energetic. You know, it's about really trying to like raise the vibrational frequency of the planet. Like so I'm I'm working on that level as a poet. And I love that this program is for the air. You know, it's like I really believe that the radio and airwaves that that is our medium, you know, like as poets and and it's so it's timeless, it's endless. And, and I believe what we put out, you know, like on that signal that it that it really has the power to to change 
to change the world. Like, I really believe that, you know, it's like, I never think of myself as an activist, you know, like, but I know that the work is activating, you know, and so it's like the activating potential of a poem, I believe is in its like the it's in the sound, it's in the frequency. So that's my mission. And so to use diaspora, I really like that word. I like, I like, I like the feeling of the word. Like, I like how, I like how it feels in my mouth. It's like, it's so, it's such a, it feels like such a sensual word. Um, but beyond like the, the denotation of diaspora, I think I, I like the word because I feel like it encompasses all beings on the planet and not just a specific, not even just specifically humans, but like all life on the planet. We're constantly in motion we're constantly migrating and dispersing and spreading. There's a lot of spore, you know, like in septet, you know, so it's like sometimes when I think of diaspora, I'm like, well, I would like to think that what I'm breathing in, you know, our ancestors were breathing in, you know, my my father, it's funny, it's like he was talking about the, the glaciers, you know, and the melting ice caps and what's happening is those melt and, you know, just kind of like the, the different life that's being released, you know, from all of that melting and being, you know, put back into the water. And, you know, and he said this to me a few years ago, and I've been thinking about it ever since, you know, where it's like, yeah, like that is also diaspora. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's all the change, you know, that happens from that. But I think in, in terms of, I'm always like trying to think beyond just the human, you know, like, I think we focus so much. You on, are so you know, right. Right. You have given us so many kernels of thought one is the idea that radio waves go on forever you know right. as does everything right and that's what i want to that's why raising the people do not know what raising the vibration means but they feel it and right. if enough of us meditate if enough of us do this if enough of us spend send spirit through radio mm -hmm. everything will change Right. Everything will change. So let us have another poem because you are an agent of change. Thank you. We're talking to Fahima Ifa. Voyage of a Sable Poetics. And then one day you drift across a burning coastline to tell me not to turn any more tricks. That trickster season was behind us. We needed new rights now. Rights of passing into a new version of maternal maturation at the helm of what our red feathered aunties knew and dreamt inside rooms of their own making in the common rooms at the kitchen table delivered to us first as burning words silos like adulthood and manhood or anything hood had run its course it seems then you say that thing that goes something something alice notley i listen to you buzz inside the gap starting in and out the white noise of black light it wasn't another lonely love song we were after, a sort of endlessly composed field test to supersede all feelings of feel of the non-committal type. We wanted to scale something sensual, to run inside the complexity of years and years of loving someone on purpose. And neither of us knew how to give into or give up reluctance to grow up. So now we are boys in our complicity, in our most surreal ascension of sun rights, in our blue bodies again on earth at a crossroads of our near distant evolutionary stretch in a Pilates class at a casting call, training our collective breath work, posing self-imposed challenges like can we breathe together apart? That thing that keeps us on point is endurance. You say the great test of karma is not a series of neatly placed steps of equal composure, is an uneven set of lines and bars sent as the conditions of our waters, an eroding coastline, eroding witness. And then you hand me the twisted vines. I want to hand them back, say, fuck, not now. But the filling in your aura says this is yours, so I keep it. And just like that, wind is singing to us our collective present future tense spirit of intense relaxation. Residual trace of free love accumulates his cumulus potential in the air of things as eagle senses. And then we are on our hands and knees, delicately placing ancient grains in rows and rows of seeds, forming the bases of quantum healing. In the distance, inside the land of milk and honey, in the spirit of a village of tiny Italian farmers who put their hope inside the grain of 19th century. I wanted to make you an ancient meal for our heliocentric ancestors who dreamt us into existence. 
as if a small flitting bird in whose light felted caresses sent of bars and not a cage of free music, so to speak. It is so interesting that I know your work so well in this book anyway, and to hear you read it is a whole different dimension. The voice as connective tissue changes the word. So we have kind of a poem and then when we hear it, we have a totally different poem with the same words. Has anyone else told you that? No, I think you're the first one, but I can understand it, you know, because like when I read, yeah, I can understand that. But I think that's what's so great about poetry, you know, and the hope is that other people would read it aloud and hear into some of the other dimensions. Like I've been thinking about Septet, also the maroon choreography too, but with Septet, like certainly there are at least seven other dimensions, you know, oh. in this collection on all levels. And so sonically, there are so many. And so it's like, I have a particular register that I feel when I read them, but what you're speaking to, I'm like, as a performer, there's a part of me that would want to find the other music, you know, to read them another way, to say them, you know. Well, it's a multi-dimensional book. And it, it, we have the aesthetics on the page, which are, I say, just keep it pretty on the page. That's how I teach form. But I'll tell you, I always felt sorry for your typesetter, actually, <laughs> when I looked at the page. But then when you read it, you just have a different clause. And this book is, I hope that everyone who is not a poet has a taste of this book because they will get it. Mm -hmm. They will get something on a vibrational level, which is the only level that really works anyway. Right. Now, I have some questions for you. And um, <clears throat> this thrills me. You're going to say one thing about each of those things you teach, okay? <laughs> and at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Is it pretty there? Oh, it's beautiful. Oh. It's stunning. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish I, I, I have been to, to San Jose, which is close, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I loved it. Okay, number one, you teach cosmic courses on roots reggae. So what, give us a sentence about that. <laughs> um, who <laughs> one sentence. Um, well, what is reggae? Reggae, right. Reggae is a type of music that comes from Jamaica, but it's a global, you know, music. It's like it, it began there, you know, the descent, like African descendants, people who were, you know, formerly enslaved and, you know, they, <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> yeah, but how about the roots? But when you talk about roots, reggae, is it that you teach the roots of reggae? No. So roots reggae is, it's like the origins of reggae music. And yeah, so, okay. the roots, and so it's like, it's connected with Rastafarianism, you okay. know, like, right. So it's a, it's a whole thing, but I, I think that. <laughs> that that's pretty I, enough I, I though. Really that's anything. pretty enough. Yeah, Thank that you. says everything. Yeah, I, right. That says everything. Okay, the next one is cannabis aesthetics. Oh, that one is really fun. Like I've been thinking about that for a long time, you know, definitely in relationship to like black art, you know, it's like the literate, like black, like the black literary tradition, but all the genres. So dance, music, like I believe that cannabis is like the basis of all, like everything that we consider black art. And so, but then without only focusing on black art, it's like, I've been looking at all art, you know, but I'm really, I'm really, I like the creations that people make when they've openly talked about their use of cannabis. So oh. you know the creator has a relationship with cannabis. And then like, I like, I like going back and kind of engaging with the art that they make and thinking about how that cannabis helps like shape. the. It has to be the only course in the world taught right? on that. And I wish I took it. How about goddess rituals? There are a God. lot of rituals in this book. Right. There are a lot of rituals in this book. And I think that Santa Cruz is like a place, it's like easy to kind of do ritualistic work with students here because a lot of the students have their own, you know, sort of daily rituals that are about like being with the land, you know? So it's like, whether it's going, you know, being with the beach or surfing, um, hiking. Um, a lot of my students, like a lot of my students, it's like, you know, I live in a place where um, people are allowed to have relationship with cannabis and with magic mushrooms. And so a lot of my students do, you know, have like, they have those relationships that are very ritualistic for them. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of the classroom, I like to just try to like help them think about what they're already doing, but like to help them ground. So we do a lot of like breath work together, a lot of meditation, a lot of um, movement outside. 
Um, I try to get them to focus on doing one thing every day for the quarter and allowing that to kind of shape their creative process. Oh, that, that is becomes so good. The assignment, and it's such a personalized assignment, you know, like, and it's not about a grade. It's just really about them, you know, grounding. It's about discipline also. Exactly. Being a, being a disciple to something. Right. What is ra radical storytelling? Sounds like everything you're doing. Right. I know it's like that root again. Um, yeah, again, it's like, you know, the students like a lot, you know, if they don't really like the writing assignments or they feel like they're not good writers. Like I was like, I don't like when a student is like, I can't write. And I'm like, that's not true. I'm like, yeah. you are talking to me right now, you know, and you're, you know, so it's like with radical storytelling, I again, just try to like bring it back to, to the self and to the, to their subjectivity, which I don't know. It's like, I think the era that we live in now with social media, it is about subjectivity, but I think for so long within the context of the university, you know, especially like I was trained in the social sciences. So that's an objective, you know, sort of space. And it's like, there are traces of that where students are expected to have this distance between themselves and what they're thinking about or what they're talking about. And for me, I'm like, no, I want you to get really, really close and intimate with your own person and allow that to, to shape, you know, what you're thinking about and how you're talking and to not be afraid of that. And, you know, I hate to use the word, but all you need is love. Mm -hmm. All right. you need is love. And you do teach that too. And I actually think you teach poetics and love, or is that just embedded in everything else? I mean, I think it's just everything that I do. Like even my name, Fahima Ife, a, a translation of it is sort of like understanding love. So it's like, and that wasn't my birth name. That name chose me like 20 years ago when I was 22. And um, I feel like every day I come more into an understanding of what that actually means. But yeah, it's so integrated. And it's in the work, it's in the teaching, it's in my life. Like, yeah, love, it's it, it's all love. And Pharaoh Sanders, like Pharaoh Sanders has been with me for, for a while now. Like I think for the past six months, I'm always haunted by like one, you know, someone, you know, like for at least a year. And so this year it's Pharaoh Sanders. And um, I'm thinking of the, what is that? Love, love is everywhere. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> that you are going to be known for what you do. And I can't think of a greater compliment. Can we have a final poem? Yes. Wait a minute, before we have a final poem, there's been one question I wanted to ask, and that is the use of the word astral, because it shows up a lot in your work. I just have to know why that word means so much to you. Okay, I don't know. I think, you know, as a young person, I feel like, I mean, I've always been a poet, but I've only been practicing for the past maybe like five or six years. But as a small child, maybe like three or four, I felt like I was having my first poetic experiences where I was receiving or where I was like sort of leaving. And I started to do a lot of astral travel without like any, you know, guidance or anything as like a three and four year old. And I understood like, I understood this space that we think of as dreaming, but then there was another space that I could like go to, you know, that felt very liminal, but still connected to this reality. And so now it's like, I've got many years of experience of moving there. But while I was writing this collection, I have a dear poet friend, um, Ian U. Lockerbie. We have a, um, a micro press that we're, that we're co-editing together. But at the beginning of writing Septet, Ian and I, like we would talk about these sort of like shared dreams we were having with some of our favorite living poets. And then we'd be like, oh, so-and-so showed up, you know? And then, and so then we're like, we started to think of that space as the astral porch. Oh, you know, because it is, time, but it is. Right, right, isn't it? And it's like, but at the time we were living in New Orleans, it's a porch city, you know? So it's like to think oh. of the porch, you know, it was kind of, but just the astral, it's like, yeah, no, I feel like I, I go there like when I'm stuck, you know, um, creatively and I don't even know that I'm stuck. And then I'll just have this really enlightening, like we might be in the astral right now, you know, like, yeah, I'm like I think kind of we are. Right. Aren't Actually, we? I've been there. I've been there. I live there a lot and I know exactly what you mean. And so since you mentioned Lucius, um, this magazine, I this is what I like. When people say there isn't really a journal that fits what I want to say, I will just start that journal. Mm -hmm. So this Lucius, actually, Lucius means archangel, right. archangel of light. Mm -hmm. It also has a demonic possibility. Right. So tell me about the complexity of Lucius. Well, I mean, I think both like, I, so like for both of us, I think we were two poets who were 
preoccupied with light and shadow, you know, like in sort of like um, positive space, negative space. So I think maybe that's part of it. Um, but it is, a, it's a site where we, we felt like we were, we were looking for a new sort of contemporary poetry scene. Mm. And, and you we, are, and you found it? Well, I think we were trying to create it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, but we, but we know, we definitely know like the lineages that, you know, that we write in. And so Lucia's is a space to celebrate, you know, already like established so, poets and then emerging poets. They're like you, poets that do they have to be like you or can they be unlike you? They can, they can be unlike, but I think what we're interested in is like the sonic. And they so better like, have the vibe. They better right. It's it's that it's the vibration that we're interested in more than anything. It's not like it's not we're not interested in like certain names. You know, sometimes people will do that where they be like it's just about the person's name or it's not that. It's the vibration. Well, here's what I wish. I wish that you lived next door and then I would walk over and have tea with you. I know. Maybe Let's that will happen. happen. Let's have it happen. Well, Let's we can we can meet in the astral anytime, Grace. I know. I'll put on the tea. And right. um, now let us really have a final poem, a final poem. from okay. Fahima Ifa. I'll do um, Entheogenic Rush, which is the first poem in the collection. One. Coming with is easier to blur after iris and sacrament signal the spores as body turns to vapor in a portal in a scene of blessed fusion. Anonymous birds float in as Black Rasta man says life begins at dawn with a mycelium. Cruising lone coast is easier than ever to go on insane among the insane, just venting to one's mutual selves in public, singing love among species and a lichen in a boneyard, in a sly curve of laughter as if a flush verb against a winged flesh wall, as if a cask rushing out the police, calling out a flash of all, saying floral, we must bless it now. Two, fungus turns to river rain inside a wooden jupe, listening to it release us beyond, beyond. In the after, Mama Coco says, they sent all you Negroes out to the Inland Empire with the illusion of a big house in Oasis now holy from the inlands, wow, and yes. I wanted us to sing and dance a mycological world to enter it holographic and make it rain. In life, we are skanking on a coast in need of husk, curling at the rims beneath the crowns of. Three, being wind, it says, is like having a hollow sensual experience in ultra consciousness in the monastic vein of learning how to weave training one's hip in the cadence of shepherd may i have another reason it gets lonely inside the quarters beating it over the head with a concept like bebop 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 bop bop all night long learning how to cruise learning how to tense and tease in public i was tuning in to practice to listen to you speak john coltrane wanted to make cars I want it to be satiable. Now a hot whisk grinding stone, pondy stone, coming when it call it right as grain. I want it to be satiable, the voice of Fahima Ifa. And this is the poet and the poem from the Library of Congress. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media Production, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Cinebit Fund, Ravada Foundation, the Anne Arundel Council for the Arts, Natalie Canivore, and Sandy Jackson-Cohen. Mike Turpin's our engineer, and I'm Grace Cavalieri. <laughs>